This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Xiao Yu. I'm a code wrangler for Automatic. Um, I work mostly with the WordPress.com backend, doing uh, things like trying to make searching better, um, coming up with, uh, with related posts, things like that. But those are my contact information, and they'll be there at the end of the slide when um, we can have questions. So I'm going to talk about basically how you can make clouds and cloud computing work for your WordPress install and make your site better and faster and all that good stuff. So first of all, um, how many have heard of cloud computing or cloud whatever? Right? Yeah, so a good number of you. Um, and the stats confirm it. Cloud is basically eating up computing, um, as shown by Google searches for the past four-ish years. Um, but, I mean, what is it really, right? Um, I like to think of it as it's basically like Zipcar, right? You don't have to have a car uh, to use a car with Zipcar. With cloud computing, you don't actually have to own the servers, the network infrastructure, the databases, the security, and everything else to basically build a website and publish it out there. But it's better than Zipcar in that with Zipcar, you can write, you know, a car. With cloud computing, you can basically get anything from, you know, a smart car to a bunch of Saturn V rockets if you really wanted. Right? <laughs> so a lot of people say that cloud is infinitely scalable. Uh, I Google this. It doesn't seem like anyone actually said this, but I'm pretty sure someone said it. It is infinitely scalable as long as your budget's infinitely scalable, right? AWS will take all the money from your bank account to give you a billion servers. But cloud computing actually breaks down a little further than that. There's actually three different types of cloud computing, and this kind of factors into how much you want to get into it and how complicated you want your system to be. So first you have um, infrastructure as a service, then you have something called platform as a service, and finally software uh, as a service. So what are they really? So with infrastructure as a service, you rent computing resources. So you go to, say, AWS and say, hey, give me five servers with a terabyte of disk each. Right? With um, pass, you basically go, I want to run a Java application, or I want to run a PHP application. Give me something to do that. And then finally, with general um, SaaS, Anyone here uh, build a WordPress site and then host it for their clients? Yeah, see? So you're all cloud providers. You basically provide a service, a software for the end client, and they don't have to worry about any of those abstracted stuff. Um, I mean, Google does everything, so here's a good example. Gmail is a SaaS service. You just use email. If you want to build your own email service, you use Google App Engine and just deploy, you know, a PHP script or Python script or whatever. And if you want to get really into the weeds of it, you can use Google Compute Engine, rent servers, to build a stack, to build a software, to build a service, and everything else. But how does this help your WordPress install, right? Uh, well, there's different cloud providers in all those three categories. Depending on what you use, it's either really easy or really complicated. It's either something that you go completely into the clouds or it's just a kind of an add-on that you can turn on and off at any time to speed up your site. So let's go over, I'm gonna go over basically three examples of these. Um, the first one, it's probably the easiest. Uh, full disclosure, I do work for Automatic and we make WordPress.com and Jetpack is also made by Automatic. So take that what you will. But it's basically a plugin, so if you ever installed a plugin or search for a plugin through uh, your dashboard, you just click it, install it. There's one extra step of you have to register an account on WordPress.com and connect the two, but that's pretty simple too. Um, it acts like any other plugin. You can activate and deactivate at any time, so I'm not going to go into too much of that. So it's probably the easiest cloud solution. With it, you get something like 30 additional features and we're adding more all the time. So 
that's too much to talk about, so I'm just going to talk about one feature. It's called Photon. So what this does is this uh, Photon is actually two services. One on the server side where we basically give you a public API where you can proxy any image through it. So any image, you can have the WordPress.com infrastructure serve it. On the Jetpack side, it's basically a plugin that goes through your content. It doesn't remove or change your content or images or anything. It just makes it when someone loads your page, it automatically loads your images from WordPress uh, so that you don't have to hit your server every single time. You just hit your server once to get the image up to the cloud, and then the cloud sends it out. Why do that? That sounds complicated, right? Why put a middleman there? So this is the stat I just looked up yesterday from the Internet Archive. Right now, across all websites, 63% um, of your page load comes from images and images alone. What this means is basically someone going to your website, if you don't have a cloud server doing this and you have just your server doing it, all of those requests are coming to your one server. So that server has to contend with serving images, generating your post, uh, maybe accepting comments for moderation and everything. Turning on Jetpack, suddenly 63% of everything that your server has to do, the cloud now takes care of. So that's pretty sweet. That's a pretty good speed up. So moving on, um, a more intermediate uh, solution. So there's a service called Cloudflare. They basically take this concept of Photon to the next level. Instead of just doing your images, they basically do what Photon does for your entire website. Uh, basically, the way it works is uh, you have your domain name handled by uh, Cloudflare. And what Cloudflare does is every time someone says, I want to visit you know, example.com, they say, oh, yeah. Example.com is served by me. So the user actually ends up going to Cloudflare servers. Once they're there, Cloudflare servers then says, okay, Example.com is actually you know, this site on HostGator. Cloudflare servers then goes and pulls that content into Cloudflare and then from Cloudflare to the end user. That sounds pretty complicated and needlessly uh, like long, right? Why go through multiple servers? Well, kind of the same idea. So Cloudflare has something like 23 servers worldwide. So for example, if someone goes to my website, which is hosted somewhere in Virginia-ish area, if someone from California goes there, they have to go to some network uh, layer in California, get sent to probably Chicago, get sent to New York, get sent to uh, Virginia, all the way to my server. With Cloudflare, that trip happens once. So they hit Cloudflare servers in Los Angeles. Cloudflare servers go all the way over the country, grabs my content, and stores it. So the next time someone from California comes, everything's so much faster. And they don't even hit my server. So I don't even have to serve that one request, which speeds up things even more. Um, this does present some unique problems, like, for example, if you have comments, how do you control how long those comments sit in your queue? Are you fine with people commenting and you approving it and maybe it doesn't appear on your page for the next five minutes type of thing? Um, we can talk about all these later in the question section if anyone has specific questions, and I can also do a demo of all this. And finally, the most advanced is you go full on into the cloud, right? So there's a, servers, uh, there's a service called Heroku, uh, which is a pass service. So it's not as difficult to set up as, say, something on AWS, which you can also do. But they basically take, uh, you can package up WordPress uh, into a Git repo, send it to Heroku, and they will basically spin up a server with everything you need using your code. So it sets up the entire WordPress install for you that you control. 
And then you can dynamically say, no, no, there's a lot of people coming, so why don't we have 10 servers instead of one? Um, just with the click of a mouse on their website. Uh, so it's actually really simple. Uh, I actually tried to do the. This is actually what I'm running my own personal website on. Uh, I can do a demo of this right after this talk, but it's basically five commands, and you have a new website up and running. There's also a bunch of other people running uh, more advanced versions of the same idea uh, to give it more performance and whatnot. So I guess the key takeaway I want to give you is WordPress is actually built pretty well to integrate with the cloud at multiple levels, whether it's at the simplest just turning on a plugin and then having you know over half of your website load decrease, or if it's building completely in the clouds. Um, just as an example, after I built my site on Heroku and used Cloudflare and everything else, I did a simple load test on it with the service called Blitz.io, and they basically simulate uh, traffic. They simulate someone attacking your site, say, with a million hits an hour or whatever. And this ended up being the result. Unfortunately, I didn't want to pay for the extra users, so at most it can send 250 users at once to my test site. Uh, at that, it ended up being uh, telling me I can sustain 2 million hits a day with a response time of 46 milliseconds. And this was on something that was completely free. This is on the free tier of Heroku, the free tier of Cloudflare, the free Jetpack plugin. You can do amazing things in the cloud. And it doesn't have to break the bank. It doesn't have to be super complicated. It's something that everyone should take a look at because no matter what your level is, it's going to help you and it's going to help speed up your site or it's going to cost you less money. Uh, both of which are good things. Uh, so with that, um, I know this was kind of a high-level overview, so I'd like to open it up for questions or if people want a demo. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, Jetpack. Yes. Uh, I've used it on and off and um, wrestled with the performance issues a little bit now and again, uh, but that's not my question. My question is, what is the value proposition to automatic to provide this? Right. So basically, for with Photon in particular, with Automatic, um, I don't know if people knows, but we host a lot of very large clients, like the New York Post and TechCrunch and the Next Web, things like that. Um, so with that, we end up having to build out our server infrastructure all around the world. I mean, with server infrastructure, if you have it, it's a very small incremental uh, upgrade to host a lot of other people because we already have the capacity to handle the huge spike when, you know, Apple announces a new iPhone on TechCrunch, right? So we have that extra capacity. This is something that, you know, with Photon, it's true. Automatic, I don't believe, makes any money from it. Uh, I can't see how, uh, but I'm not in those discussions. But, I mean, at the same time, with Jetpack, you know, we do try and upsell you on some of the modules. So there's, you know, backup with um, uh, Vault Press that comes with uh, Jetpack where you can just one-click backup your entire site. And that is a yearly or monthly or whatever service fee. So, um, so Photon is sort of the loss leader, if you will. Basically that and, I mean, uh, Automatic is also kind of a weird company in that it's, I mean, it's Matt Mullenweg's company, right? Like, we all have a mutual interest in seeing WordPress thrive. If there's, you know, WordPress is now, what, 20 plus percent of the web? If WordPress is 40% of the web because it's so popular, it's so, uh, people like using it, it's so easy and it's so fast, I mean, just a small, small, small fraction of that, if that goes to, you know, WordPress.com VIP or like someone's, you know, cooking blog blows up and all of a sudden they need 
services from Automatic, I mean, that's a win for Automatic. Right. That's also a win for the entire community. So, it's sort of generally promoting the brand. Exactly. Okay. Um, yes. So how, how do you differ from like, the content delivery networks such as like the Atmai or maybe like the Rap Space? Right. Uh, so, Photon is actually a CDN in itself, in that it is a CDN designed purely for images. So we do uh, any casting, which means if you're coming from Texas, you go to the automatic Texas cluster. If you're coming from you know, Europe, you go to the Amsterdam cluster. And we're setting up new server farms all the time right now. So it is, it's definitely not as robust as um, Akamai. Uh, we don't have, we basically don't have tier one uh, servers in every single node. But you're also not paying ten thousand bucks a month for it, like Akamai. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, yes, you, sir. Yes. Right. So that is um, with Photon. We don't promise anything except that if you put something through Photon, it is theoretically forever. So if you publish a photo and put it through Photon, and then you want to unpublish it, that's not possible. It's there. That's not to say you can delete that photo and always get it back from Photon. At a certain point, if not a lot of people view it, uh, there are back-end processes that end up clearing that cash out. Uh, so it's definitely not, I don't propose it as a long-term storage for your most valuable photos. But at the same time, if you put something through Photon, it's not coming out, basically. Once you hit publish, it's there. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Also, if you have a protected site, Photon's not going to work because... If your images are protected, our servers at Automatic aren't going to be able to get to it. So it's not going to be there. Are there any extra steps in terms of setting the caching or making allowances for Photon? Uh, so... Uh, So Photon is basically another layer of caching on top of uh, Super Cache or WP Quick Cache or any of those caching plugins. It's um, it's basically a, like um, the gentleman before said. It's a CDN layer. So your image ends up. So if you have say WP Super Cache, uh, that image could potentially be on you know your server, get cached into memory with WP Super Cache. And then when Photon gets it, it gets cached into the automatic servers in Dallas, say, right? So then when someone gets that image, it'll first try, you know, the automatic servers. If the automatic servers don't have it, then it'll go to your website where WP Super Cache will try for it. If not, then it'll fall all the way back. But if, you know, WordPress servers have, say, even though you removed it and deleted it from your server, it's still existing on WordPress.com servers, so you're not going to be able to basically expire it. Um, so it is something to be uh, aware of. It is something... Um, so if you have, say, a website and you change a photo, right, you can't upload it with the same name because that's the old image will still keep showing up. You can modify the name, like, you know, my image dash two. Uh, and then it'll show up. It'll, that's another photo that will get cached by a photon. Yeah. Exactly.
So we use it at, uh, at Astonish. We use W2 Engine, which has a varnish cache. It all works perfectly. And then we work with other people who use uh, W2 Total Cache and other things like that. That works just fine. It sounds like Photon should be part of the bottom half. You know, the only reason that, uh, you know, from our level as an enterprise solution, you know, we're worried about Proton is that it's a free service. And that, you know, Automatic has the right to take it away whenever they want to. That's their right because they're giving it to us for free. We're just a benefactor. For them. So as from an enterprise level solution, we do that. But from a freelancer or agency level, I don't personally, my expertise, I don't see any downfall. Uh, yes. This is not a code related question, uh, non technical. But uh, from your, in your personal opinion. Uh, with web publishing and development getting so user friendly, where do you see the industry headed in like five years? Ooh. Uh. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> first. <laughs> So first caveat is I'm a code monkey, basically. So <laughs> take everything I say with publishing with a grain of sand. But I mean, um, I personally am very excited by where publishing's going. Uh, I think publishing's getting easier and easier across all platforms. I mean, not just with WordPress, but you know, five years ago you didn't have Tumblr. You didn't have something where you can sign up and then start posting like within two minutes, right? And that's kind of where we're trying to go with WordPress.com, where it's not this huge, gigantic thing that you have to set up and you have to manage with plugins and everything else. Uh, hopefully, we can roll some of those enhancements into WordPress core so it becomes even easier for even self-hosted websites. But, I mean, it's basically, as uh, Matt Mullenweg always says, it's democratizing the web, right? Everyone can publish. It's back to the old, you know, back to the revolution, Benjamin Franklin's day, where, you know, everyone, like, if you, you know, have a printing press, you can publish. Everyone has uh, their own soapbox. Not, It's not controlled by, you know, Time and CNN and Washington Post and things like that. So I think it's exciting time to be alive. Uh, yes. A while back, I set up a Heroku site for clients, and it didn't get a lot of traffic. And it seemed like the response was incredibly slow. But so if you did the the next time, you get the same sort of traffic. Yes. And I was wondering, is that because of the low traffic, it gets low priority in the ad service? Yes. Uh, so this is a very interesting problem. I ran into this exact problem because, you know, it's just a random personal site. You know, I have like 10 friends go to it, and that's pretty much it, right? Um, so this is very Heroku specific, but what Heroku does is um, they give you one, what they call Dino, which you can consider a machine, right? They give you one machine for free, and then any machines on top of that you pay for. So the problem with this, with Heroku's business model is, you know, chumps like me that go, I just need one machine. I don't have that many people. Uh, so what they do is somewhat sneaky and smart at the same time. Uh, if you don't get traffic for, I believe, five or ten minutes in a row, uh, they spin down your instance. So they put your machine into a sleep state. So then when someone hits your website, it's gonna be. It's gonna take about ten seconds for it to spin up the machine to serve the request and then to become "quote unquote" active again. Um, so I have, I do two things to basically mitigate this. First is I have Cloudflare in front of my Heroku instance, so ninety percent of the time you're hitting Cloudflare, you're not hitting the Heroku instance. So the response time's super fast; it's instantaneous. I believe all of Cloudflare's servers are on like massive amounts of RAM and SSD, um, which is why if you, uh, I don't have that graph up here, but I can show you that graph later. But if you look at the response time from Cloudflare, it's something like 
you know, 200 milliseconds for the first, you know, 100 milliseconds of a load spike, and then it drops down to like 30 milliseconds because everything's loaded from RAM. But the second thing I do is I use a service um, called uh, Status Cake. Uh, what Status Cake does is it loads your website on a timed interval to tell you if your website's up or not. So it's useful in telling me, okay, my Heroku instance is down or something's wrong. But also, because it's loading it every five minutes, my uh, dyno never really goes to sleep, so you never have that spin-up time. Uh, if anyone from Heroku asks, I'm not doing this for that reason. What was the service? The pink service? Uh, it's called Status Cake. Uh, uh, is that a follow-up or? Oh. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Cloudflare is actually a little complicated to set up, uh, which is why it's intermediate in my slide. Um, basically, by default, out of the box, uh, Cloudflare will cache your images. It will never ever cache your HTML pages. And with your images, it sometimes, depending on what they call page rules, will or will not obey your cache headers. Um, so you can configure Cloudflare to basically always respect your cache headers and to um, do what your website says to do. Uh, but that is a little bit involved. I wrote this long blog post about it that I can link to in uh, our meetup thing. Uh, so it's not that difficult to set up, but there's a couple <laughs> steps that you need to go through and hoops you need to jump through to get that set up. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so how about the other direction, the upstream? Uh, comments, uh, hits, orders? Yes. So um, obviously, the with uh, either a Cloudflare or Photon or any of those services, you get none of that benefit, right? So with Heroku, um, if you suddenly say you have an e-commerce site and suddenly you know a product that you just introduced blows up on Twitter or you know TechCrunch links to it, uh, with the cloud service, that's their bread and butter, right? You can go into their interface and say. Okay, I want, you know, instead of five servers, I want 50 servers right now. And within a minute, you have 50 servers serving your request. The other side of that is it becomes a little complicated to manage. So, for example, with my Heroku instance, um, I can't use auto update because each Heroku instance is in self a self-contained server that they spin up and down, right? So if I use auto-update, one instance might auto-update itself, another instance might not auto-update itself. So you have, you know, you can potentially have 3.6 and 3.7 running your website at the same time talking to the same database, which is just all sorts of bad news. Um, there are ways to manage it, uh, manage that. Um, you basically have to use, uh, Git or SVN to track your revisions, upgrade manually, and push everything by yourself. There was actually a really good talk about this at WordCamp San Francisco that's up on WordPress TV about how to manage your deployments using um, Git. I highly recommend first looking at that if you're um, thinking about going the full on, I'm going to play everything on Heroku use you know, a bajillion dinos at the same time route. Uh, it's also a little bit more in depth than I can talk about right now for this talk in that once you have, you know, that layer set up, there's this idea of a persistence layer in the cloud. So with a regular web server, your web server is your persistence layer. It knows about the people coming in. When you're in the cloud and you have 10 servers, I go to, you know, widget.com, it gets loaded on server A. I get sent to server A. 
I click on, you know, page X on widget uh, A.com, I could get sent to server Z, right? So uh, the concept of persistence layer is you have to figure out, okay, where do you want the layer that connects everything together? And that's a layer that you end up having scaling issues, right? Because you can spin up a thousand servers, but that those thousand servers have to talk to this one service to figure out who's ordering what. Like, does customer A have like you know product one in their shopping cart or product two? Um, there's literally like dozens of books written on this, uh, and it's something that is incredibly interesting to think about and to do. Um, that's pretty much all I think I'm gonna say for this talk, but feel free to come up and we'll talk about that after this. Yeah, I have my own ideas on this. Definitely. Um, anyone else? Is it you jumping off the rocks? Uh, yes, yes it is. Is it a suicide attempt or is there water below? Uh, there was water below. Uh, interesting thing is there's also another point uh, to the left of that, which I also jumped off of, which was a waterfall. And at the time, I wasn't told of this, but apparently there were uh, volcano tubes in that part, and people have died getting sucked into it. I was told that after I jumped in and uh, swam out and everything, and then I was like, are you trying to kill me? I thought we were friends here. I never got an answer to that, so I guess my friend was trying to kill me. Where's that located? It was in Oregon, um, Central Oregon. <laughs> Thanks.